cases are warning that people with the fast spreading Delta variant of COVID-19 may think that they just have a cold. The Delta variant, which is driving South Africa's third wave of infections, was first detected in India. Thousands died in that country from the variant, which also saw relatives scrambling to get hospital beds for sick family members. Professor Mary Ann Davis, who is director of the University of Cape Town Center for Infectious Disease Epidemiology and Research, joins us now to talk more on this. Good evening, Prof, and thank you so much for your time. People with the Delta variant may simply think that they just have a cold. Talk to us then about some of the symptoms of this variant. Um, thanks very much for inviting me, Bongiwe. Um, so data from the UK where they collect symptoms of people who are registering for COVID tests have shown that the symptoms seem to have changed a bit. Um, and obviously the Delta variant is very uh, prevalent in the UK at the moment. And that people are more likely to have a headache, a sore throat, a runny nose and sneezing. And the high fevers and the loss of smell and the loss of taste and the sort of body aches that were very prominent with the earlier COVID waves uh, seem to be much less prominent. Um, with, with this COVID wave, particularly in the UK, but uh, also anecdotally, we, we have had reports from South Africa as well. And so from what I understand is that even a, a thing as simple as a running nose will mean that someone may need to self-isolate, is that correct? Yeah, so we don't know. Obviously, it's, it's also um, cold and flu season in South Africa. And so if you do have a, a runny nose or you're sneezing or you feel like you've got a cold, it's possible that it is just a common cold, but it could also be COVID. So the safest option is to isolate as soon as those symptoms start. You can go for testing uh, to, to confirm whether it is COVID or not. But um, even if you don't go for testing, you should still isolate because although you might only experience these very mild symptoms. Um, if somebody who you come into contact with is older or has a comorbidity, they may actually become very unwell. So um, one needs to be much more vigilant uh, around um, what may seem to be uh, sort of uh, negligible symptoms. So does this then mean that as soon as somebody has what appears to be flu-like symptoms, not opt to just self-medicate only, but try to see if they can get a COVID test? Is, is the, would that be the correct way to then approach it? Um, so I don't think it's essential that people get a COVID test because otherwise all our testing facilities are going to be swamped. Um, but what I think they do need to do is to, for example, um, uh, you know, avoid any social events, um, try to isolate as much as they can from other members of their family, um, not, not go out and do shopping, try and get someone else to go and do that, and, and really to avoid public places, avoid going on a plane, um, any opportunity to come into contact with, with anyone. Of course, we should all be social distancing all the time because we know that uh, people can even be completely asymptomatic and still spread COVID. Mm. But if you do have um, a sore throat or a runny nose um, one, one, or, or a headache or symptoms that make you think I might have a cold, one should be aware that this could actually be COVID. And so it's important to try to isolate as far as possible. We know that that's difficult. Um, if, if you are able to access testing easily, then certainly, you know, go and get a test so that you can confirm. But it's not essential to test. Um, people must just take the appropriate precautions. All right. And do we know then from the research why uh, this variant has a different symptom profile? Um, we don't. And, and what isn't clear is that this has been particularly found in, uh, in the UK, in England. And of course, in England, they have vaccinated most of their older population. And so most people who are getting infected now are younger. And so it may just reflect that this is what the symptom profile is in younger age groups. Or it may be because of uh, people being partially and fully vaccinated. Um, so the system profile might be different and milder. 
but we have heard reports in South Africa, um, not, not formal research, but reports from people in hospitals and from GPs that they're also seeing much more in the way of these cold-like symptoms. And obviously in our situation it's different because we don't have a widely vaccinated population yet. And so it does seem that the symptoms may be different and obviously we need to do further work to understand this. What we do know is that the Delta variant is substantially more transmissible. And uh, scientists at the moment are trying to understand the exact biology uh, to explain why it spreads so much more easily. But it's possible that that mechanism also results in different symptoms so that the virus is able to uh, replicate or make copies of itself faster and able to get into cells faster, and that may result in different symptoms. But we don't know that for certain yet. Mm. And when we then look at this particular strain, of course, uh, we have heard that it ha it's, it's highly transmissible, uh, a lot more quicker than, you know, the beta variant that we would have seen in the past as well. Talk to us then around the hospitals in the Western Cape in particular. Are they battling and also feeling the pressure? Um, so we have seen a notable increase in our hospitalizations, initially predominantly in the private sector, but um, in, in the last two weeks our public sector admissions have, have also gone up. Um, we don't know whether this variant causes more severe disease yet, but obviously because it's more transmissible, that means large numbers of people will get infected and even if the same proportion of the people have severe disease as with previous variants, that is going to result in more people needing to get admitted to, to hospital. Um, in the Western Cape, we ha have substantially ramped up our hospital capacity. We've learned from the previous two waves and we have um, two intermediate care facilities uh, with a large number of beds available. Um, we, have, uh, we are closely monitoring the situation with regard to oxygen and uh, are well prepared in terms of oxygen provision. And we also have a very good system for moving patients between facilities so that no single facility gets swamped and no emergency center uh, gets swamped with patients so that we're able to move patients to the, the best place for them to receive care. Um, so, so we are planning at least for a wave that is as severe as the second wave, but are also looking at ways to flexibly uh, ramp up capacity should we need to be on that. Mm, and how much concern then uh, are the rising numbers for the Western Cape, especially when you look at the numbers that have been recorded in the last 24 hours? You, you, literally, the province is one number short of reaching 2,999 cases recorded in the last 24 hours? Yeah, so, I mean, we, we obviously are concerned about the, the rising number of cases, and we watch that very closely. Um, we do need to note that testing is more widely available in this wave than it was in previous waves. Um, so with... Um, uh, with the availability of antigen testing. We do see more diagnoses being made. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean more people actually have COVID. It's just that people are better able to access diagnosis. And, and we are watching that closely and watching our admissions closely. But our admissions at the moment are still quite a lot lower than what we saw in the second wave. Um, and given that we've already been through that and we're prepared for that, um, uh, and, and have now learned from the second wave. We are confident that we will be able to cope, but we also need all of society to work with us to, to keep the curve as flat as we can. So staying at home, social distancing, uh, mask wearing if you have to go out, and washing hands as much as possible because reducing or slowing down the number of infections will reduce the pressure at hospitals and will mean that you or your loved one uh, will have space in a hospital when you need it. And let's look then at the ban on alcohol uh, for the next uh, you know, few days. Has it yielded any, any results in the province, particularly when you look at uh, the trauma units? Um, so uh, 
we we this is the first weekend which is the the big impact of the uh the the complete alcohol ban is on um trauma units uh, over the weekend because that's when we have our highest trauma burden so it's a little bit too early to say because um we will analyze the data on monday following this weekend but we do know from the previous complete ban that there is a dramatic reduction in the number of trauma admissions um particularly over the weekends whenever there is an alcohol ban um we've seen reductions um in the order of you know more than 50% reductions and then subsequent increases once alcohol is reintroduced so uh you know unfortunately it is one of the few mechanisms we have to reduce the burden on our hospitals and i'd like to really probe you on on something uh you know uh, that is not in the western cape but we've seen in gauteng and also um in 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 uh guasul natal uh, quite recently and these are some concerns around super spreader um events let's look then at the impact that this then has on the rising covid numbers at a practical level especially when you have large gatherings like we would have seen uh, you know people gathering outside former president jacob zuma's homestead and there have been some covid-19 um you know alerts that have gone up there to say that you know this may have been one of those super spreader events and there may be concerns there around the safety just how much of a practical impact do these events have on the numbers then that we then see recorded by the NICD yeah so i think it's i mean we we've had um incidents in the past where it's been uh, quite well documented after the event that a particular event was linked to transmission to a number of people usually these are indoor events um with lots of people together for an extended period of time um so those are the ones that we worry about the most but i think the the thing about uh covid is even if you don't know that you've got covid or you don't isolate if you avoid gatherings and you um avoid do, do social distancing um it's possible to that that you only spread the disease to one or two people um but what has been shown is that a lot of covid transmission is driven by a small number of people who transmit to a large number of people and obviously gatherings would promote that happening and so certainly um you know we would support uh the restriction on all gatherings at the moment it's not forever but during this time of a covid wave you know if there are a large number of cases around the chance that somebody with covid is going to be at a gathering are very high and then the chance of spread is extremely high and particularly at the moment with cold weather it's not, we don't want to all go and be outside it's hard so gatherings tend to be indoors and that's a particular concern when we look at the developments then uh the fact that you know uh, 50 50 plus uh you know people uh, aged people can now register uh for the covid jab and then you also look at the uh, approval albeit with conditions of the sinovac vaccine how does then help in terms of making sure that more and more people are getting vaccinated um so we really welcome uh the the uh, opening of vaccination to the over 50s and um what we know is that the Pfizer vaccine is even a single dose of the Pfizer vaccine provides very good protection um against severe disease including from the delta variant and two doses provide very good protection against both mild and severe disease so really we encourage everybody to register and to get themselves to a vaccination site as soon as they can and to get their jab into their arm because the sooner that happens and the sooner we have um large numbers of people particularly our over 50s protected um that will help us because uh, what we're aiming to do with the age stratified approach starting with the older people and moving progressively to younger people is to make sure that those most at risk of severe disease and most likely to need hospital are protected and then that will reduce the burden on our hospitals so we really do encourage people to register and to to get themselves vaccinated if they are eligible
All right, Prof, thank you so much for your time. Certainly do appreciate it. That 